my churches are in Osbaldwick and Merton. But part of my role is that I am the Green Ambassador for the Diocese of York, the Environmental Officer, if you wish. And that's why I am here to talk tonight about mission and the environment. The five marks of mission in a time of climate crisis. Now, do not worry if you cannot read the smaller print on the screen. I will read out anything that seems too small on the screen so that you can follow it if you are watching this at home as well. What you certainly must be able to see are the colors on the screen, and some of you will be able to recognize them as a familiar, now famous, graphic, um, visual interpretation of the temperature trends over the last 100, 150 years or so. Since 1850, temperatures have slowly started climbing upwards and are still rising. And we read it in the news very regularly, don't we? Once again, this was the warmest month. Once again, this was the warmest year. Another record has been broken. I don't know if you remember last summer. I certainly remember that we got into the 40s degrees Celsius in the heat wave. I looked up the records, and here in Yorkshire, I think it had only ever been about 37 degrees. That's a full three degrees warmer than it's ever been. Now, that could be a freak occurrence, a coincidence, but if you look at the scientific trends, it's very clear that there is indeed something happening to our climate, and we find ourselves in a climate crisis which has dramatic effects upon life on Earth. In fact, when last year the latest report for the International Panel of Climate Change was uh, published, the uh, United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said, I've seen many scientific reports in my time, but nothing like this. Today's report is an atlas of human suffering. And that's looking at the human perspective. But of course, this also includes the suffering of the whole of creation and of all other creatures. It is sometimes like there are waves after waves of bad news. The smallest wave there is COVID-19. But after COVID-19, there is the recession. And once the recession is starting to calm down, there will be climate change. And once climate change takes its full proportion, there will be biodiversity collapse and so on and so on, wave after wave of bad news. This is not very cheerful. Where is this talk going? Well, compare this image to the image I would like to show you now, which again includes big waves. It is a beautiful icon of Jesus calming the storm and leaving the waves behind us. What is my message tonight? That Jesus will suddenly solve the climate crisis for us? Unlikely, but he can. And that's the important thing. God has the power over all creation. He is the creator. And somehow the good news that we proclaim must reflect that gospel truth. So what is mission? What is good news in a time of climate crisis? And how do we share this good news? Mission is simply that, isn't it? Mission is sharing the good news of Jesus, or that is how it's often traditionally been interpreted. But the way in which the church has shared the good news of Jesus Christ has not always been good news for the planet, for the earth. Traditionally, this is what we thought was mission. Mission took place somewhere far away, on the mission fields, by missionaries who went out and risked their lives to tell the heathens about Christianity, or a particular white Western form of Christianity, sadly. Despite their good intentions, seen from an environmental perspective, the old missionaries did significant harm. You see, the problem is, often the indigenous peoples 
knew very well how to live in a careful, balanced relationship with the natural world around it. And part of that was um, almost recognizing the divine in all of nature. So, so, so a tree would be occupied by some kind of spiritual force. The rivers would have their own river gods. And of course, when the missionaries arrived, they said, no, that's all nonsense. That's pagan superstition. You need to get rid of all of that. And therefore, they made the natural world just material and even a commodity to be traded and exploited. Never mind that there are spirits in the woods. We're going to cut down this wood because this wood is very valuable. And this broke that balanced relationship which the indigenous peoples had with their natural environment. Now, I'm not saying there was no good news whatsoever in that missionary activity, but it certainly wasn't good news for the environment. Another particularly bad example of mission um, was following on from that in the 18th, 19th, even into the 20th century, when in particularly in evangelical American theology, there was this idea developing that Jesus would return and would take us all with him into the sky because there is one Bible verse in the Bible which seems to say something along those lines. Thankfully, it can be interpreted very differently, but nevertheless, people came up with this idea of the rapture when God would take us with him away from the earth. And so all we had to do until that moment was try and save as many souls here on earth so the famous evangelist D.L. Moody said, I look upon the world as a wrecked vessel. God has given me a lifeboat, Jesus. And he said, Moody, save all you can. We're going to leave this wrecked vessel. We're going to row away from this place and it's just going to sink. Indeed, more recently, a very popular megachurch pastor said, I know who made the environment. And he's coming back and going to burn it all. So yes, I drive my SUV. There you are. Some forms of mission that may be good news in some respects, but certainly not for the earth. Now thankfully, in the Anglican Communion, there has been a particularly influential council in the 1980s where they try to formulate some kind of um, definition of what mission is. And they came up with these five marks of mission. It was the Anglican Consultative Council of 1984. And this definition of mission was then later adopted by General Synod in the Church of England as well. That was 1996, believe it or not. So we've had this definition for a while, but it still feels very right. The mission of the church is the mission of Christ. That is actually a very important sentence that is often forgotten, that first sentence. What we are here to do, what the mission of the church is, is the same as what Christ is here to do on earth. The mission of the church is the mission of Jesus Christ. Then what is that? To proclaim the good news of the kingdom, like we have been doing for many centuries, to teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. We can't just leave them um, after we have converted them, but we have to take them and, and nurture them and teach them about the faith. Um, to respond to human needs by loving service. That is also mission. That's mission in action. It's not just about words. To transform unjust structures of society and then in 2012, they added more to that sentence, to challenge violence of every kind and to pursue peace and reconciliation. That too is mission. And then the fifth mark of mission, the last mark of mission, which some people thought was a bit of an add-on at the end. Oh yeah, we also have to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. 
And when this diocese was asked last year to uh, formulate its order of preference, like what is the most important mark of mission, what is the least important mark of mission, sadly, people said the fifth one was the least important. Um, I'd like to address that issue tonight. First of all, I don't think it's very helpful to put them in any kind of order. All five are the mission of Christ. And if we miss out one of them, mission isn't proper mission, isn't right anymore. So we shouldn't put them in a list. We shouldn't put them in a hierarchical order, ever. We should always hold them together in, if you wish, a pie chart or something like this. As the church, we are sharing the good news, go across the screen, seeking justice and reconciliation, nurturing followers of Jesus, caring for creation, offering loving service. It's not about the order, but these different elements are what makes mission. Sometimes they have been uh, summarized as the five T's, to tell, to teach, to tend, to transform, and to treasure. And I saw one particular example where they changed that definition of mission to a definition of love. This is our expression of the love of Jesus in the world. It is to treasure creation. It is to tell people about that love. The five marks of love rather than the five marks of mission. So is creation just the fifth mark? That is what I want to spend a little bit of time on tonight. Because I believe that the environment and creation are essential to each of the marks of mission. And I will take them in the uh, traditional order, but with that very strong footnote that I don't believe they should be in an order. But there we are, the first one, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, to go and preach. Um, do we do that just randomly? Some people do. Some people put up their little uh, stand outside the train station and start preaching the good news, just reading from the Bible as loud as they can, um, and that is mission. That is preaching the gospel, the good news. And there's something to say for that. But we have also learned that it is much more effective to be um, considerate in how we address people and to uh, look at the context of how we do that. Indeed, we want to earn a hearing. We want people to ask us a question, like I can see in your life that you're doing things differently. Now, why is that? What is behind that? Can you tell me more about that good news that you believe in? Indeed, our actions need to back up whatever we say. Our authenticity and credibility are prerequisites for a good proclamation of the gospel. Sensitive evangelism presents the gospel message in a way that is relevant to those who are being addressed. It needs to be obvious that we are listening to the world, looking at what specific problems there are, and then addressing them with the good news of the gospel. Now, today's context is a climate ecological crisis that threatens the whole future of humanity. With that background, then what is good news? How do we proclaim good news addressing that particular context? Here are some bits of good news that we could share. We believe in a God who not only created the world, but also continues to be involved with this world, who sustains creation and indeed works to restore creation to the fullness of life. At various points within the Bible, the prophets say that God is doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? God is making everything new. And Jesus in his resurrection is part of a new creation. It didn't all end in Genesis 1 and 2 and now we're just waiting. No, this creation is constantly evolving and getting better within a new creation that Jesus uh, makes possible. Indeed, the Bible begins and ends with a garden, but not the same garden. 
the last garden, the garden in Revelation, the garden of heaven of paradise, that is the new creation, is even better than the one that Adam and Eve are placed in, in the book of Genesis. Indeed, Adam and Eve are representatives of the wider humanity, and they have been created in the image of God, which means that they are commissioned to have a special role to represent God and his divine rule on earth. They are stewards. They extend the rule of the king in their tending and caring for the earth and its creatures. That is a very special calling. We are not a pest on earth, although it often seems like that. No, if we live our lives right, we are able to be good stewards of the earth. Like Jesus showed us as the one true image of God and Lord over all creation, he could live in perfect harmony with creation and indeed creation always obeyed his will. Now I could talk all night about the incarnation and the resurrection because through the incarnation that divide between the creator and creation was overcome somehow mysteriously but what an approval that is of the goodness of the material world that we find ourselves in of the human bodies that we live with that God wanted to be like that with us what an approval of creation and the worth of creation and then when we see Jesus again after he is resurrected he is not different he is not a spirit or something like that he has got a body still but an even better body a transformed body so the material isn't cancelled out but it is reaching its full potential and therefore the promise of reconciliation for all creation is held in the resurrection of Jesus. And lastly, we have some good news to share about the possibility of forgiveness after we have come to realize how badly we have messed up. A new start. I'll come back to that in a moment. Here's some good news, some preaching of good news, some proclaiming of the good news of the kingdom that we can do in relation to the climate crisis. The second mark of mission is to teach and baptize and nurture new believers. And again, this is about context. We're not teaching new believers to live in the days of the Old Testament, not even in the days of Jesus and the New Testament. We're helping them live their lives to the fullest with God here and now. Once again, this is about equipping Christians and the Christian community to respond to the challenges and the dilemmas of today and the ecological crisis that we find ourselves in. Are we able as Christians, are we equipped, are we nurtured to talk about the scriptures from an ecological perspective? Do we live Christ's story in our relationship with the earth, with creation? Do, does our care for creation reflect God's love as the creator? Again, making this a bit more practical. I believe that Christians go to the supermarket like anyone else, don't they? However, I think it's a completely different exercise if you are there with Jesus and thinking, what would Jesus buy? How would Jesus shop? There is a real ethical question about some of the project products that we consume and how they are produced. And, um, and, and, and all, the, all, all of that is part of our living with Christ, our discipleship, and we need nurturing and teaching. For instance, when it comes to our consumption of food, these are the loaf principles which have been produced by a charity called uh, Green Christian. And they say, whenever possible, when you consume food, try and make sure that it's locally produced, if possible. Minimize the food miles. Organically grown, if possible. Minimize the pesticides and things like that. Animal friendly. Discuss if it's even possible to eat any meat from the meat industry as it is at the moment. Fairly traded, if that is an issue in the countries where you're buying your food from. It's not always possible, 
to live 100% according to these principles, but every time we are able to make a choice, we have an opportunity. The same goes for our carbon emissions. Will we be part of the problem, or are we indeed, as Christian, agents of the solution, saying we make choices that are low carbon because we believe that we care about creation because Jesus loves this creation and we want to confess our former mistakes in that respect. All of that is part of restoring our relationship with the earth and at the bottom of it all, joy and enough, human greed and human overconsumption has done so much harm and damage to creation. That is what is at the bottom of it all. How can we learn again to live with just enough? like the people lived about a hundred years ago, even in this country. I do remember my grandparents eating meat perhaps once or twice a week. Not every day, and not as much as we do. Things like that. Joy and enough. So that is about the second mark of mission. Teaching and nurturing new believers. How do we live as Christians within the climate crisis? The third mark of mission very obviously relates to the climate crisis. Loss of biodiversity, concern about the future, all of that creates human need. And this can range from uh, natural disasters which are brought on by human-induced climate change, flooding, um, the uh, failure of harvests, uh, you name it but also much closer to home, people who are suffering from, from, from mental sadness and anxiety, mourning the loss of the countryside, lamenting the species that are going extinct. If we find ourselves in a new wave of extinctions, that is something to be worried about. If these species were not supposed to be here, God would not have created them or allowed them to evolve, however you want to uh, see that. But, you know, if God didn't want those creatures to be here, they wouldn't be here, but they are here, so they're part of his plan. And therefore it is not up to us to let extinctions just happen. How do we respond to human needs in loving service around the world? People are losing their livelihoods harvests that fail, etc., etc. You see the stories on the news, but also much closer to home. We have got increased flooding in this country. We have got our new and uh, unpredictable agricultural challenges like heat waves. And we are indeed already experiencing great economic damage. When was it? A year or two ago, I think, there were these horrible floodings in Germany. Very unexpectedly. Terrible floodings. And it cost billions and billions and suddenly the German government woke up and said we cannot afford not to do something about climate change you know first of all we were thinking about oh we can't afford to do something about climate change no we can't afford to not do something because this will cost us this will damage our economy and then lastly climate anxiety which I want to tell you a little bit more about because it's such an important thing especially for younger generations. There was a study in the University of Bath um, which uh, did a survey of 10,000 children and young people between ages of 16 and 25 across the world in 10 different countries. I give you the authors and the link there. But these were some of their findings and they are quite shocking. Nearly half of the global youth surveyed, 45%, say that climate anxiety and distress is affecting their daily lives and functioning. This is something that plays a role in the lives of young people. Indeed, 75%, that's three out of four young people, believe that the future is frightening. When I grew up, I didn't think the future was frightening. If you live in the Philistines, where there has been much more flooding, that figure goes up to 92%. 92% of the young people in the Philippines 
are worried, think that the future is frightening. Indeed, almost 60% of children and young people surveyed were very or extremely worried about climate change. More than half said that they felt afraid, sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, guilty. This is a proper academic university study. This is not just trying to find the green teenagers who might say the right thing. This is properly done. And this is what these researchers found about young people around the world. 55% felt that they had fewer opportunities than their parents. 65% felt that the government was failing them, that not enough was being done. Almost half of them um, said that they talked to others about climate change but felt ignored or dismissed. And of course, young people in the global south were more worried about a greater impact on their functioning. Well, people in the global north were a bit less worried, except for in Portugal, where they just had a lot of wildfires and where the people had suddenly seen climate change coming very close to home. Climate anxiety is a real mental burden for our young people. And if mission is about reaching the next generation and reaching young people, this is a topic not to be ignored. This is a human need that we can address in loving service. What does a missional church look like in that context? It needs to be a place where people can come and share their anxieties about the future with one another and with God. Where they can confess their sins and the sins of their society. Sometimes we just say, like, it wasn't my fault, God, but I still feel the burden of guilt of just being part of this system. And I want to talk to you about it. There is no other place to do that. You have to come to God for that kind of confession. Um, and then, of course, in the gospel message, there is always hope and a new start and the inspiration to take action and to expect more than we can ever imagine. I'm moving on to the next mark of mission, to transform the unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind, to pursue peace and reconciliation. Now, I think many of you are aware that climate change is indeed a justice issue because some people are affected worse than others. And it is the people who are poorest and the people who are already struggling the most who are also worse affected. And the people who are better off, who are richer, who've got a bit of a barrier, um, they are the people who are less uh, effective. That is injustice. That is a justice issue. In fact, you could also see it across generations in that an injustice is done to the next generation. We are stealing from their quality of life. We are overusing the resources that are available and therefore we are leaving a future that is worse than this future. That is a form of injustice. That shouldn't be allowed to happen. And of course, when it comes to pursuing peace and seeking reconciliation, what do you think will happen when resources run out? When it will become hard to get food? When it will become hard in some places to get water? When people have to become refugees? Will that add to the peace and well-being of our world? No, it will only feed political conflict and war and conflict and war and so on. Indeed, perhaps the best work on this aspect of climate change is uh, by Pope Francis, <clears throat> Laudato Si, his encyclical, some years ago written already, on care for our common home. What a beautiful phrase. And he says, everything is connected. Concern for the environment does need to be joined to sincere love for our fellow human beings and an unwavering commitment to resolving the problems of society. All these things are connected. So the fifth mark of mission is not some kind of afterthought. Oh no, not at all. It is essential for all the other marks of mission. Indeed, we should not separate them. 
we should not put them in a order. So where does that leave us? How do we respond missionally in this context of a climate crisis? Well, I think we need to manage our expectations, first of all. I'm sorry to tell you we can't solve the climate crisis. We really can't. However hard we try, even if all of us would act together, we can't solve the problem. And a lot of people say, well then, why am I even bothering? If they're not going to change in China, in America, then why are we even trying and spending money on this? Well, that's not really how Christians live. That's the wrong kind of question. Because we believe that even though we can't change the problem, we can't solve the problem, we can have some impact, but not enough, we still know that God can. We believe in a God who is giving us a different future. Indeed, that's why we live as Christians um, living out the, the values of our baptism. We try and be a new creation. We do not conform to the patterns of this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that is mission. We are doing things differently. And hopefully people will see that we are doing things differently and ask us why we are doing things differently and we can tell them about that hope that we have and about a God who can help us and make a difference. And I strongly believe that this is a problem that will be solved, but I don't believe that it will be solved purely by human resources. I think we need God's help. And so to help us on our way, there is this excellent uh, initiative that Arusha UK have introduced, and I know you're already aware of it, um, and anyone in our deanery should be, because we want to be an eco-deanery. The Eco Church Project, which looks at five different areas of our life as a church. It looks at our worship and our teaching. Do we pray for creation? It looks at our use of land. If we've got a bit of a churchyard, how do we manage it? It looks at our building. What's our heating system like? How can we make it most effective? It looks at our community and global engagement. Can we work together with other partners around us? And can we support others on, in other areas of the world? And lastly, it looks at our lifestyles, our individual lifestyles, this nurturing and teaching of disciples. And that's a very important one. Because I did some calculations as the Green Ambassador for this diocese. I calculated how much carbon emissions arise from all our heating systems in all our churches and all the travel of our staff and, you know, all our investments. I don't know what else. It was a whole list of emissions and it all added up. And then I looked at how many people came to worship in our churches on an average Sunday and how much emissions they create as average UK citizens. And what I found is that if everyone in our pews would reduce their emissions by 5% on an annual basis, that would basically offset all of the emissions created by this diocese. So all of our heating emissions, all of that, would be offset by a 5% reduction in our individual emissions, our individual lifestyles, if we would be able to do so year on year. So Eco Church addresses all of that and is an excellent tool. It's very, very easy to sign up. It will then give you a website which gives you a survey. You go through the survey, and as you go through the survey, you have plenty of ideas of how to live better and tread more lightly on the earth as a church family. Then there's something for your PCC to look at, the practical path to net zero, which is produced by the Church of England. And it's just a tick of list to look around your church building and see, like, what can we do already to, to reduce our emissions? Okay, we might not replace the heating system this year. That might be later. But we can already look at, can we perhaps turn the thermostat one, one degree down? Can we make sure that there is no damp in the building? Things like that. And then, of course, help the church to do that uh, reduction year on year by completing the energy footprint tool for those of you who are in church leadership. And if you're interested in it, educate yourself 
with an excellent, excellent program of webinars which the Church of England produces and also uh, Arosha, the charity that runs EcoChurch, has got great resources on their website. I'm coming to the end of my talk, but here's one last slide. And it reinforces what the universe, uh, University of Bath uh, research told us earlier. But this is a, a bit of research that was done by Tier Fund and by the Youthscape Center for Research. Um, and um, they found that nine out of ten Christian teenagers uh, are concerned about the climate change. So we saw it was um, three out of four, it was 75% generally around the world. If you ask Christian teenagers in this country, it raises to nine out of 10. And they found that a lot of these teenagers talked with their friends about climate change, but it was not something that they found easily, you know, that they could easily talk about in church, sadly. One out of 10 thought that church was doing enough. Only one out of ten thought that the church was, was you know, and I, phew, that is just so sad. I would like teenagers to randomly walk into our churches and to immediately notice that these churches are making an effort. To immediately notice that there are things done in the place to conserve energy. Um, that there is a focus on the beauty of creation, that kind of thing. Because that is one of their concerns. And if they are there to bring that concern before God, but they look around and they see absolutely nothing being done about it, what is that communicating, you know? And that's why it's so important that we are engaging with Eco Church. Um, because if we don't, we burn down our own house, not just in terms of burning down the planet, but also the church in the sense that young people will not be attracted to coming to our churches. I think that's a very important bit of research to be considered, and that's what I'll leave you with for now, talking about the five marks of mission in a time of climate crisis. Now, those of you at home, you probably can't ask me any questions, but those of you here, if you've got a question, I see a roving mic appearing from the back, so if there's anyone with any questions, I'd be very happy to answer or try and answer. There'll always be questions that I can't answer, but I might come back to you. And I always very much appreciate it to even get questions that I can't answer, because I might answer them next time round. Anyone's got a question? Have I explained it all so well that you have no questions whatsoever, or are you just very concerned and have lots to think about? <laughs> Yes, go on, please, a question. And I shall repeat the question for those at home. Okay. Um, you had one top tip that any church could do as a first step. What would ah. it be? One top tip that any church could do as the first step. Oh, my goodness me, that is quite difficult because, you know, there's so many things to do, isn't it? So what would be the first thing that I will do? I think... Carbon emissions are a real problem. I think, you know, that, that is an issue. And 84% of the church carbon emissions arise from their heating system. So if you can turn down your thermostat by just one degree, that actually has quite a big effect. Um, and hopefully nobody will, be, nobody will notice. <laughs> but, you know, that, that, that is a good thing to start with, to look at your heating and how you can make it most effective. Uh, but it is also a little bit boring. Um, perhaps the number one thing should be mention it in your prayers. Preach about it. Uh, do a Lent course about creation. Um, you know, get the message across. And then people will, will think about turning the heating down anyway. Oh, it's hard to answer. Very good question. Yeah, I wish that... I mean, they call this the... Um, the low-hanging fruits and the easy pickings and things like that. And there are webinars on the Church of England website which address that particular question, like, you know, what can we address tomorrow if we want? Um, so you could perhaps look at that. Um, Just... Yeah? Uh, LED lighting. Yes. <laughs> LED lighting, 
but as I say, lighting is only about 15% of your emissions. So um, focus on your heating first, and then do the lighting as well. Every little helps. Yeah. It's about an attitude, isn't it? You can't always change everything, um, but do what you can. I'm still answering questions if you've got any. In case the people at home think something has gone wrong with the internet. But if there are no other questions, I'll hand back to Jackie perhaps. Is that all right? Thank you very much for listening to me and thank you very much for watching at home as well, Jackie. Okay, so thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Jan, thank for, you. for coming this evening and making that presentation. I think, I think step one is, is just saying, being committed to actually yeah. starting. And I think as a deanery, we have committed to that. So that's the first step. The second step is starting to do it, which yeah. Is, yeah. is something that we need to do. And I think this evening has been part, I, of, part of that. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm just inspired by what you're saying. And I think like I need to tell you about this. I mean, starting to do something this year, I uh, trained to do uh, carbon literacy training. Um, and carbon literacy training um, invites you to, 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 to pick up one or two areas in your life to actually make a difference in your carbon emissions as well. And one of the commitments I made was like, I'm gonna sign up my churches to Eco Church. And I did, I went into the website. I should have done this way earlier, but finally I did it. I went up to the website, signed up, did a survey, and found out that we are, almost already at bronze at St. Thomas, and I think we're already at bronze at St. James because they haven't got any um, fossil fuels coming into their building and they're on a renewable electricity contract. So that was really easy. And it was just such a boost of, you know, of, 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 of knowing like, okay, we're already doing things right, but we could do better. You know, we, you know our, our, our churchyard is absolutely mown to death, as we call, as we call it. So, so I'm, Monday night there will be a PCC meeting at St. Thomas Church, and I'm going to suggest two areas in the churchyard where we let the grass grow a bit longer. Just see what happens this year. Um, it's that easy. And it's really encouraging when you go on that journey to know that, you know, it's making a difference. Yeah, that's a very good one. Commit yourselves to do something. Come on, act. Enough talking. <laughs> Thank you. We know what to do then. We've committed to it, so now we need to answer. Thank you again, Jan, Thank very you. much indeed. Thank you.